my privilege to introduce the first of our keynote speakers. Um, I, Dr. Bill Daggett, who is the founder and chairman of the International Center for Leadership in Education. And when I was a principal, I remember being very much engaged with his work on rigor and relevance in our schools and in our development of curriculum. He has a system for effective instruction that has impacted the entire country as public schools and non-public schools have embraced his ideas. So it is my pleasure at this time to welcome Dr. Bill Daggett. Thank you, good morning to all. Oh, well, thank you very much. Now I have to be careful, that that doesn't hit this mic or you'll get a lot of feedback. Uh, good morning everyone. Good morning. I'm delighted, I'm honored to be here with you. I had a chance today to share a little information with you, but um, if you haven't heard me speak before, I need to caution you. Uh, I am never politically correct. <laughs> Say what's ever on my mind usually gets me in trouble. So just be glad after about 30 minutes you never have to see me again, okay? Uh, to uh, begin my session, however, I'd like to find out a little bit about you. Uh, how many in the room have a son or a daughter who is a preteen, a teen, or in their early 20s? Okay. For everybody who just raised your hands, how many of you hope the person you just raised your hands about sometime in the next decade becomes independent? <laughs> Is there anybody that doesn't want that? <laughs> because if you don't, you are one sick person, let me tell you. Uh, let me ask you another question, seriously. I think in the room now a recent four-year college graduate who is now back at home with mommy and or dad made the decision to go to graduate school because they can't find meaningful employment. Or they're off on their own, but their parents are still having to help them financially. How many know somebody like that? Not part way up, hands way up high. Put them way up high, keep them way up high, keep them way up, keep them way up. Anybody in the front hand got their hands up? Look at the rest of the audience. <laughs> what happened, folks? These are our success stories. These are the ones you're trying to make all the other kids like. Well-educated, broke, unemployed, <laughs> living in their parents' basements. Why? happen and it's not because we have high unemployment we have very low unemployment rates what happened folks what happened is America changed and I'm, I'm afraid we're in a race to return to the past in our schools the comments I'm going to make to you today are based upon two national commissions that I chair one is one that I do with a group called the Council of Chief State School Officers. Every state in America has a state superintendent or a state commissioner who are the only school district in the America that has a local superintendent and a state superintendent, one in the same. Okay? You must feel schizophrenic some days. Um, but the 50 of them are called the Council of Chief State School Officers. That group, and uh, I head up the International Center, but I also head up a uh, not-for-profit called Successful Practices Network. Our two groups, with support from the Gates Foundation, spent 10 years now going across this nation to find the nation's most rapidly improving schools. I want to underscore something. I didn't say highest performing schools. If you want highest performing, you only begin in the most affluent communities. These are the nation's most rapidly improving. Schools that were in the bottom 10% of their uh, state uh, five years ago, now in the top 10 percent. And we've sent research teams into them, we get under the covers to see what they're doing differently. A second national study that I'm now chairing for AASA, that's American Association of School Superintendents, our organization with financial support from Hope Mifflin Harcourt, we are now also studying the nation's most innovative schools, but successful innovative schools. And to make our, the cut on that, um, first cut of it, you had to do two things. You had to show dramatic improvement in student performance for less money than you were spending before you started the initiative. And 
why is that second one important? Is because, folks, we, we got to find some different models here. We can't just continue to make our system 2-3% to 3 more expensive each year from the previous year. So, high performing, cost effective. In both studies, we select the 25 best examples in the country. And what I'm going to try to share with you in a quick executive summary today is what we're finding. And the number one thing we're finding is that they are very future focused. They put a stake in the ground three to five years out and say, what will our kids need to know, do, and be like? It's just what the student speaker just said. It's just what your governor just said. It's just what your superintendent just said. They build back from the past. What do our kids need to be successful in the future? Um, and when they begin to look at that, they find that these kids' future is fundamentally different than the world you and I grew up in. What they also learned is culture trumps strategy. Until you create that culture, that you need to be future focused, you'll never change your schools. We'll become a Kodak. Now why do I say Kodak? Does anybody know who created digital technology? Kodak. Who didn't use it? Kodak. How come? It threatened the existing film industry that they had to foothold in. Uh, these schools are very future focused and what they do is they really think about how are things changing. Uh, how many in your room own an iPhone or a device like an iPhone? Hands way up. Okay, how many in your room do not? Okay, everybody's living in the 21st century, that's good. Can I borrow yours? Okay, good. Um, let me ask you, do kids have these? Are they almost an extension of their bodies? Can you get email on these things? Can you get total internet access? With one word, you're going to get one word to answer this. Do you let the kids use these when they take your smarter state test? For a good reason. One word. They would what? Cheat, exactly. Tell me how they would cheat. They'd Google the answer. What else might they do? They'd share the information. So they might either use resources or work with others. <laughs> what are the two most basic skills you need to be successful in the 21st century? What do we call it in schools? Let's yell out. What's this replacing your life in the last five to ten years? What do you no longer have because you have these? Give me some things. A camera, dictionary, video camera, and relationships. Very good. What else? Encyclopedia, maps, compasses. Pardon? Conversation. Watch, flashlight. I've done this with an audience and giving them five minutes. The most I've ever got is 102 items in five minutes. Okay? Never had less than 30. They replaced them. This is information technology. When you put a stake in the ground three to five years out, which I'm now going to try to do in my remaining time, what I'm going to show you is the amount of change we've seen because of this technology in the last five years is child's play in terms of what we're about to see and that I think we are in a race to prepare kids for the past. See, we're about to enter the fourth industrial revolution. First industrial revolution, long time ago, we went from ammo power to steam power. Second industrial revolution, we went from steam power to electrical and mechanical power. And the American assembly line was born and America became the preeminent economic power of the world. But I want you to think about those assembly lines. Everything was timed. And every worker became a specialist. You went to your workstation. You had a task to do and you only had so long to do it. Time and specialization became the hallmark of that second industrial revolution. And the American public education system adopted it and ultimately regulated it and certified it and tenured it and contracted it. Everybody's a specialist. I teach social studies, not math. I don't know what goes on in math. 
I'm the science teacher. I'm the phys ed teacher. And every class is the same amount of time. That's crazy. Even in my little family, I have five children. Um, I have a daughter who scored a perfect score in our SATs. We are really proud. I have a daughter who is now 40, uh, four years old, whose mental age is somewhere between 12 to 18 months. We have severe epilepsy. Seldom has a day without at least one grand mal seizure uh, and has autism. <coughs> I have a son who was a pretty good student, had a son who loved to go to school, just never went to any classes. <laughs> and I have a son who at the age of 11, when he stepped off of the school bus in northern New York State, was run over by a drunken driver, spent nine months in a coma and on life support systems. Does anybody in this room think you could take those five kids from one family in the same amount of time and get them to the same educational objective? But that's what we expect in our schools. Because we're still on the second industrial revolution. Third industrial revolution, the best example I can give you is the iPhone, but we could talk about all, a lot of others. It's the fourth industrial revolution I want to talk about. I want to put that stake in the round. I want to show you what's about to happen. The U.S. Department of Labor just released a report and they are projecting that 65% of all existing jobs will not exist in the next 10 years. 65%. Now, other jobs are coming about. My fear is we're still trying to prepare kids for those 65% of the jobs that might disappear. Let me give you some examples. Um, first of all, the fourth industrial revolution is built on the third. It's built on information technology. But it's also built on physical technology called nanotechnology. How many have heard of nanotechnology? And biotechnology. Now, nanotechnology. In labs throughout the industrialized world, there are now developing microprocessor chips that are one one hundredth the width of a human hair. And one of those microprocessor chips now had more computing power than mainframe computers had in the 1980s. And a really important, I'll come back to this in a few minutes, they are the texture of jello. Um, let me give you some examples. I'm going to start with some kind of entry level jobs, then we'll go to higher level jobs. Uh, Department of Labor is projecting an 80% decline in masons. People lay up brick in the next five years. 80% decline. Why? Ten times faster than a human being, less materials, more uniformity. A 70% decline in carpenters. Uh, I'm sorry, painters. They can paint a 3,000 square foot house, which is a good size house, all the walls and trim in 90 minutes. 60% decline in carpenters. If that last two surprised you, look at this one. Just a little bit back there. By the way, uh, anybody know what, uh, what uh, Amazon recently purchased? A supermarket? Whole Foods. They're in a move to take over the entire food industry. What? 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 Too hard. Here we go. Just 
UPS, FedEx are projecting a uh, five-fold increase in deliveries in the next five years and a 40% decline in employment. Next one, uh, Kia car manufacturer, <laughs> Troop County, Georgia. Uh, the now largest U.S. manufacturer of cars in domestic United States. is turning out a new Kia car every 57 seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it has a total of 112 employees. That's nanotech. Now let's add biotech to it, because it's the combination of bio and nanotech that are going to fundamentally change our lives. I could give you a lot of different examples. I'm just going to give you two in the healthcare industry. Um, that is the new pacemaker. It's out, been out now about three months. How many in the room know somebody with a pacemaker? Historically, about this big. Planted on you, no longer. This device is inserted through the groin, up attached to the heart. It has a battery that lasts 18 years. Monitors the heart 24-7, instantly shocks it like a normal pacemaker would. It's child's play in comparison to what's about to hit next. How many in the room ever had a vaccine for polio when you were a child? Okay, how many did you have to get? One, two, or three, depending on how old you are in this room. But then you had it for the rest of your life. It stayed in your system. Bio nanotech chip. Remind me, how big are the nanotech chips? One one hundredth hair. Texture of what? Done, has worked in animals, just beginning human trials. Give you a shot into your circulatory system with hundreds of bio nanotech chips. One one hundredth the width of a human hair. All programmed to do different things. Some of them are programmed that if they go by a cell, a artery or vein that is becoming weakened, it immediately identifies it. Or an artery or vein that is beginning to become, uh, have plaque built up. Uh, how many of your doctors already have a portal they're asking you to go to to get information about yourself? It goes from the bio nanotech chip to your handheld device to your doctor's portal. The big debate in the medical field right now is whether that same bio nanotech chip will be able to do what I'm going to describe next or whether you'll have to get a second shot of a bio nanotech chip to do it, which is it would would attach to the weakened artery or vein and reinforce it. Or if it's a plaque, it would attach to it and slowly, gradually dissolve the plaque. Other bio nanotech chips going through your body for the rest of your life. Identify if it comes within one inch 
of any cell that is beginning to malform in your body and zap it. What three diseases have I just identified? Cancer, heart disease, and stroke. Three leading causes of death. By the way, what's it going to do to longevity? What's it going to do to Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare? What's it going to do to pressure on school budgets? Before I go any further, is this biology, chemistry, or physics? Oh, no, no, it can't be all three. Never, never. May they meet. Who knows why we teach biology, chemistry, and physics in that order? It's alphabetical. It is. It's a decision we made 100 years ago. How many of you can type? Not well, but at all. Put your fingers on the keyboard. Feet flat on the floor, back straight up. <laughs> Taught you how to type. Okay, hit the letter A. What hand is it? What finger? Pinky. A, E, I, O, U. Try it three times in a row. A, E, I, O, U. A, E, I, O, U. Smallest fingers, longest reaches, most common used letters in the English alphabet. Makes perfect sense to everybody in the room, right? Nobody in the room would want to use the home row. A, E, I, O, U. No, you go. A, E, I, O, U. How else could I create carpal tunnel syndrome? I use my left hand for 72% of my keystrokes, my right hand for 28%. Even though we have more strength and dexterity on the right than the left. Who in the room knows why we do it? Slow it down. Slow it down. How many in the room ever typed on an old manual typewriter? What happened if you typed too fast? You jammed it up. So 100 years ago, actually 102 years ago, 1917, we moved from something called the Dvorak keyboard to the QWERTY keyboard. It's called the QWERTY keyboard because that's what the home row of letters spell. It's scientifically the slowest keyboard that can be made. Technology couldn't keep up with people. Any problem now that technology can't keep up with people? So why don't we change? And my advice to you, if you know anything about brain research, don't even try. Because we've laid pathways by repetitive use. So how about my preschool grandchildren? You committed to make them as slow as humanly possible just because you are? You committed to teach science in alphabetical order because in 1919, the National Science Foundation recommended we do that because we had to have some order in our classrooms to figure out how to organize the curriculum and train teachers and build facilities. Why are all the kids at the summer off? Jeez, I didn't think everybody in Hawaii worked on farms. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our schools have become museums. And we're in a race to get better and better at the past. But it's not just entry level jobs. If you can write a task, uh, a algorithm for a task, the job is gone. These three are projected to have huge, huge reductions, all over 50% in the next 10 years. In our algorithm. The job's gone. See, technology invaded first entry level jobs and eliminated a lot of entry level jobs. But a strange thing happened, there are more entry level jobs. So how did that happen? It's because it's creating more jobs at the top. And that group at the top eats out two or three times a week, has more help with childcare. Someone else cleans their lawns, uh, cleans their houses, mows their lawns. That group is creating a service sector. And what we have is a missing middle. And the purpose of public education was always to prepare people for the middle. We have a problem. 2005, five largest companies in the world. 2017, last year, five largest. Projection, none of them will be in the top five by 2027. They'll be all bio and nanotech companies. The other issue, and your governor made comments about this, the student speaker did. Big organizations have a hard time responding quickly to the change. 
That's why I like to streamline. I told streamline that she's state superintendent and local superintendent. You eliminated a layer, which is really good. Large organizations can't respond. The reality of it is the growth is in small companies. Most of your kids are going to work in small companies. And you know what you have to do in a small company? Everything. The opposite of how we have our schools organized. The other issue is I can move work to work or anywhere in the world. <coughs> Shenzhen, China. I was there in 2007. It's a picture from 2007. I didn't take the picture, but I was there. I want you to look at those two buildings. Oh, sorry. 2007. I returned last year. Let me show you a picture from the exact same angle. And we can't change a bus schedule. <laughs> or a bell schedule. Or a room someone teaches in. So what do you do? Let me close with that. Everybody look at this list. And in a minute I want you to yell out your opinion. It's okay to be different than the person sitting next to you. What two numbers on this chart do you think students will have to function at as adults to become independent? You all said you wanted your kids to be independent. Is it one and two? Or is it four and five? Yell out your answer now. Four, five. Okay, could be three, four, five. Am I right? I'm not opposed to state test. I ran the largest state testing program in the United States for seven years. I ran the New York State Regents exams for seven years. I'm not opposed to testing. But what do the tests measure? What two numbers on this chart? One and two. One and two. One and two is essential, but it's not adequate. Everybody recognize this? Oh, oh, whoops. I'm sorry. No, didn't have it. Uh, up the left-hand side is Bloom's taxonomy. He called it the rigor taxonomy. So put academic rigor up the left-hand side, put application across the bottom. Quad A are what the state tests measure in the smarter test. And again, there's nothing wrong with them. You can't get to B, C, and D if you don't have A. So I'm not misquoted. Again, A is essential. A is? Essential. But is it adequate? College prep is B. <coughs> I'm sorry, college prep is C. Career and tech ed, job ready, is B. The problem is, the fourth industrial revolution is eliminating most of the B-based jobs. Career ready is D. Make sense? Now you've been a great audience. My final five minutes, most important parts of my message. So pay attention carefully, okay? In the pre-internet age, we had to teach A and C because you couldn't Google it. You had to have knowledge or you had to know where to go get it. How many of you had encyclopedias in your homes when you grew up? In dictionaries. You had to have knowledge or you had to know where to go get it. In the internet age, you've got to teach B and D. That's what the student message was all about. And increasingly, it's just D. Now let me challenge you. Here's your problem. Well, we got to teach B and D, and increasingly D. We are still regulated, certified, tenured, and contracted by A and C. Your state, your superintendent is absolutely right. This is a design issue. We gotta figure this out. <coughs> but you're not gonna figure it out from the top down. The governors and others said that. Let's <coughs> listen to the student voice. Let's collaborate with our classroom teachers to figure out how to do it. And as you try to figure out how to do it, I have to just drive one more thing. All this involves cognitive skills. 
One of the bigger issues we have, however, is it's not just cognitive skills, it's non-cognitive skills. And I'm going to talk about this in my breakout at 10.10 this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a serious and growing mental health problem with our children in this state and in this country. And it's far more serious than our academic problem. The nation's most rapidly improving schools have got that figured out. And they have figured out if you, you've got to address that first. You begin, and that begins with the relationships. To relevance. To rigor. And as you do that, how do you do it? The last week in June, in Orlando, we're going to bring all these nation's most rapidly improving schools together. Announcement of it is in the materials I gave you today. We encourage you to send it to you. If anybody would like a copy of my PowerPoint from today, and the notes behind the slides, when you go to leave, there's a yellow sheet over here. Just grab it, give me your email, check anything you want, and throw it back on this table. If you're coming to my breakout group, bring the yellow sheet with you, uh, because we'll go over additional items you might want. Um, but let me close with a statement about the teachers. Because I think your passion to sing for student a voice, but more importantly, even teacher collaboration is so very, very important. Let me show you a video from one of the schools. Every morning is kind of the same for people our age. You wake up, you brush your teeth, you know you go to school. But then I go to her class, and once you have something happy and something good and inspiring that day, you kind of hold on to it for the rest of the day. Ms. Rivera is my social studies teacher. She's probably the best teacher I've ever had. Final video here is of that teacher. The last day of school, the kids ask her, can we interview you? And so she thought it was about an interview. So when the video starts, she's answering a question from a kid. But the other students come in the classroom, it's a middle school, in back of her. Now think about relevance and relationships, mental health. Listen to what the teachers, the kids have to say about this teacher. And I think it's important that they do. for so many people that didn't even know those doors existed. You are our biggest fan and our best coach. Every morning, knowing that I get to go to your class makes it easier to come to school. About a month ago, I got into a fight with a group of kids after school and before club because they were being homophobic. This ended with them mad and telling their friends and me crying. I was late to club, but you weren't mad at all. You asked me if I was okay and you comforted me. You made me feel safer and like I could trust you. Last year was a really hard year for me, but every Wednesday I knew that I had your club to look forward to. It also got easier as I made more friends to the club. There were people in the school that cared about me, and I never would have met them without you. I remember at the beginning of the year you were talking about how great we were, and you started crying, and I thought, wow, she really loves us, and I'm so grateful, and you totally deserve this. Can I have a group hug? Is that okay? So ladies and gentlemen, let's love with the kids and keep an eye on their future, not our past. And please understand, it's the teachers that are going to get us there. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Daggett. That was very inspirational and will help us move forward. Transitioning from Dr. Daggett to our next keynote speaker, Tom Osberg, who is the superintendent of the public schools in Denver. He is taking the message of Dr. Daggett and leading schools into this fourth revolution in our world.
world. So Dr. Bosmer, come tell us about that. Thank you. Thank you. Great, um, thank you very much and good morning. Um, Bill, that's quite a tough act to follow. Uh, I, I'd love to think we're doing about one-tenth uh, of what you suggest, but that's really be aspirational for us. Uh, there's a lot of work that we, that we are doing in Denver that uh, uh, I'm proud of and, and would love to take a minute to share that uh, with you all today. Yeah. really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be invited uh, and, and to be able to have this discussion with you. Hats off. Uh, to you in Hawaii for having opportunities like this to talk and think and, and really look forward about where you all want to be as educators, about the vision that you have uh, for the young people of Hawaii and what you can do for them and what that's going to mean uh, for your community, uh, for your state uh, going forward. Uh, so we're also thrilled uh, to be here with my colleague, Christina Kishoto. Uh, you guys are very, very fortunate to have a, a real leader. Uh, nationally, a very forward-thinking leader about what our school systems um, should look like. We've been colleagues now for uh, a number of years, and, and so just also really honored to have this chance, Christina, to come here and, uh, and be in your community and just deeply respect le your leadership and what you've done in, uh, elsewhere and what you're doing here uh, in Hawaii. All right, um, so I think I have um, a presentation, hopefully, which will be uh, coming up. I want to talk uh, a little bit and start uh, about uh, the Denver Public Schools. And, and, and we in the Denver Public Schools have, have a vision that is once at once very simple and, and at once very profound. Uh, and that vision is that every child succeeds. It, it's a deep belief in the potential and talent and capability of each and every one of the children whom we have the privilege to serve. We have an extraordinarily diverse uh, student body uh, in Denver. Uh, our kids come to us with vastly different amounts of privilege. We have some of the wealthiest communities, we have some of the poorest uh, communities. And that privilege also often translates into resources uh, of what a child might have at home or what a child uh, might be fortunate enough uh, to, to grow up with. Uh, but privilege is very different than talent. Privilege is very different than potential. Privilege is very different than ability. And we say that every child succeeds, it's about making sure that every child, irregardless of how much privilege they might have, we know they have talent. We know they have potential. We know they have ability. And it's how we try to give that child the chance to realize uh, the talent that they have, the potential that they have, and, and probably above all, realize the dreams. Uh, those of you who are teachers in the room uh, know that our kids come to us every day with dreams. I think that one of the most special parts of being a teacher is that chance to talk uh, to your students and ask them, what are your dreams? What are your dreams for yourself? What are your dreams for your family? What are your dreams uh, for your future? Uh, and how can we help realize those dreams? And we ask that not just of our students, we actually have uh, the largest parent-teacher home visit in the program. We have tens of thousands of home visits every year by our teachers uh, to the homes uh, of our parents. And, and those visits aren't necessarily about what is your grade in subject A or subject B. They, they start with one simple question, which is, what are the hopes and dreams that you have for your child? And secondly, then how can we work together as teacher and as parent to help you realize those hopes and dreams uh, for your children. So, so that's our foundational vision uh, in the Denver Public Schools, which is that every child uh, succeeds. It's a deep belief in every child. Uh, I'm proud of the progress that our educators uh, in Denver uh, have driven. In, in the last decade, we've increased our number of graduates by 70%. We've decreased our dropout rate by over 70% uh, in the Denver Public Schools. Things like expulsions. Uh, a decade ago, we were expelling 200 kids from schools every year. Last year, we expelled 38. We've decreased our expulsions uh, by over 80%. And what's remarkable, we're, we're a state in Colorado where we measure the growth that children make every year. So we know that our kids come to us at very different levels. Some come to us at a really high level, some middle, some low. What our role is to make sure that whatever level they come to us at, we're growing them. If our kids are coming to us at the highest level, we don't want to say, okay, good, you're all right, that's cool. It's how can we help you grow 
Same with our kids at the middle, at middle levels, and most importantly for our kids uh, at a lower level. And one of the striking things about our state and nationally is that lower income kids not only are coming into our schools, whether it's elementary or middle schools or high schools, uh, at lower levels, but each year they grow less academically, which means the academic divide, the inequalities of our system, aren't narrowed through our schools, but in fact are widening every year. Uh, and if you look at data of the 12 biggest systems, school systems in our state of Colorado, Denver Public Schools is about 100,000 students, about one-tenth uh, of, of the school, of the state's students. Uh, we were last uh, a decade ago in the growth of our students every year. And our data would have predicted that. Um, because of the 12 biggest districts in the state, we're the poorest. Uh, about two-thirds of our kids uh, come from low-income families. And the data would have predicted that we would be last and we were last. But what's striking now is that each year for the last five years, our students have had the most growth of any students in all of the major districts uh, in the state. What we've done is essentially flip a, a paradigm which we've seen in American education for far too long, which is the received wisdom is if you want the best education for your kids, go to the suburbs. The suburban schools will be better for your kids than the city schools. And now, that's flipped in Denver, Colorado. If you want the best education for your kid, come to the city. Your child will learn more, will grow more in the city of Denver than he or she will in any of our surrounding uh, suburban districts. Wonderful, well-reputed uh, suburban districts, but they will grow more in Denver than the suburban districts. So I want to talk a little bit about why, about the changes that we've undergone to ensure that students with often the least privilege, for example, our English language learners, our students with disabilities, are getting the kinds of supports and services they need. So that third role of equity is a critical one for the district. And fourth, accountability. That, that, that believe very strongly that empowerment and accountability are two sides of the same coin. That to have accountability without empowerment is to have just a lockstep, top-down system. But likewise, just to have empowerment with accountability, without accountability, frankly, leads, I, I think, often to unproductivity and to chaos. That it's very important that there is accountability um, for one's work and one's product. Um, so the fourth important role is to make sure that we uh, have strong and clear systems of accountability of what it means to serve all students and serve all students well. So those, above all, I believe, uh, when we say schools need to change, what is the role of the district? Learning, talent, equity, and accountability. Thank you. Go on, please. Okay. So I'll give you an example of, of how this might work in our system. So uh, uh, for several years, one of our middle schools, one of our poorest areas of Denver, where over 99% of the kids are low-income families, uh, over two-thirds of them don't speak English as a first language, we had a product in the 1950s, a, a thousand student middle school, that frankly for 50 years had struggled. And for 50 years, after intervention and turnaround and intervention, really was not serving our students well. Um, two years ago, we took that school and we brought in two new schools that just started in sixth grade. One of those is a district-run school that's a replication of a successful district-run school. And in that school, the principal of the successful district-run middle school kept, continued to run his existing school and took over the new school. He became an executive principal of both schools. And he and hired a leader for each school who worked for him as an executive principal. It's a replication of a successful school, not by moving a successful principal from his school, but expanding his impact by letting him lead two schools. And secondly, there was a, a, a very successful charter school uh, uh, system that we had that introduced a new charter school. Each of those schools built up one grade at a time. Last year they were sixth grade only, and the existing school students continued in seventh and eighth grade. This year those two new schools have sixth and seventh grade, and the legacy school only has eighth grade this year. Next year the new schools will have sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. They'll serve uh, the whole middle school. We felt it was important to build one grade at a time because of the difficulty of building a high quality new school and the incredible importance of culture. So Bill talked about that. It's one of my parents said to me once, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. <laughs> that a strong culture is so important and culture takes time. It takes time 
uh, to build. So sitting in this building now, we have one school, one district run, one charter, the district run schools, an innovation school. Uh, they're each equally neighborhood schools. They each serve students who are English language learners. They each teach students in native language instruction, Spanish, which is a critical uh, thing that we believe deeply in. They each have programs for severe needs education uh, students. And families choose that any family in that neighborhood doesn't default, that no family defaults into a school. You must choose which school you want to go to. If you don't choose, we find you. We come, we call you. If that doesn't work, we come to your house uh, to ensure that you as a family have that opportunity to make an affirmative choice and to choose the school uh, that you wish your child to go to. And I think that's a critical point around the ownership of families in the schools, the ownership of students in their schools, to not be in a system where anyone defaults to a school. Everyone goes to a school um, that they choose um, to go to. Next slide, please. Okay, and, and when we think uh, about our schools, our family schools, our charter schools, our district run schools, uh, we come to it with the basis of three equities. We believe very strongly that all of our public schools, whether district run or charter, need to operate as public schools. And in so many of these places in this country, we see sort of different systems where the charter schools operate in a different system than the district run schools. We are one public school system and all of our schools, regardless of governance, operate as public schools. That means they have equity of opportunity. Every school is the exact same opportunity to get resources, dollars, funding, public facilities. Almost every single one of our charters is in a, uh, a district-owned facility. In many cases, those facilities are shared between multiple schools. So first, equity, equity, equity of opportunity. Second is equity of responsibility and access, that all of our schools must serve all kids. We have the exact same enrollment rules for all schools. We have a unified enrollment system where every family chooses the school that they wish to go to. There's no matter whether that school is a charter school or a district run school, you list which school you want to go to. And 90% and of them get into their first choice. Those who don't uh, often get into their second uh, choice as a school. And that is a unified enrollment system with one system, one application for all families. And third, the equity of accountability. It would be a uniform accountability system, whether it's setting up a new school or, in some cases, closing and replacing a, an existing school, which despite uh, efforts to improve over multiple period of years, is not uh, showing growth in its students. <coughs> the exact same accountability system. Next slide, please. Okay. So, so to set up the system uh, of school as the unit of change, I think requires two fundamental investments. And they're in leadership, uh, and they are in culture. And, and, and we spend a tremendous amount of time investing in growing our leaders, and growing and helping develop a stronger culture uh, around a set of shared uh, community values. That starts with teacher leadership. So in Denver, we have the largest program of teacher leadership uh, in the country. So right now, of our 5,000 and some teachers, 500 of them are teacher leaders, which means they teach half the day, and the other half the day they lead a team of teachers. And those teams are five to six teachers in our higher poverty schools, eight to nine teachers in our most affluent schools. And we have a very strong belief that teaching, given its extraordinarily complexity and the level of skills that people need, that the old system, Bill talked about how our schools looked like 100 years ago, and that's very true still as an organizational model. Right, what a factory looked like 100 years ago was you had a factory supervisor and you know 30 workers who did assembly line jobs. But as we've moved to a much more high knowledge, high skill economy, you don't see that. Right, there's no whether it's it is architecture or medicine or law or high tech, you would never see a system where one person is leading a team of 20 or 30 people. Um, why? Because the learning curve is too steep. It's too steep for one person to be able to help uh, 20 to 30 people grow and develop the complexity of skills that they need to succeed in a truly complex and high school job like teaching. Uh, what you see is teams. You see teams of six, seven, or eight. So the leader of that team has time to spend with the members of that team. And the team is structured in a way to share and collaborate together. It's the teacher collaboration that you guys are emphasizing uh, here in Hawaii. So every one of our teachers is on a team led by a teacher leader. And that teacher leader is 
leads that team, they in the classrooms with the teachers on their team at least once a week to co-teach, to guide, to give feedback. They lead collaborative planning time. Many of our teams meet daily. All of them meet at least twice a week. And that teacher leader, again, is the prime person responsible, including uh, as the supervisor of the teachers on their team. And that really has fundamentally transformed our principal role to be one where the principal is a leader of leaders, that is the leadership team in the school of the principal, maybe assistant principal, and the teacher leaders, they work together. And the principal's primary role is to help their, help his or her teacher leaders become the best coach and leader of their teams of teachers uh, as possible. They do lots of co-observations with their teachers. They'll co-lead professional learning time to help those teacher leaders learn and grow. Next slide. Um, so what does that look like? Overwhelmingly, our teachers love this. So 86% of our teachers say they've had a very positive experience with their teacher leaders. While our teachers rate 82% of our principals as effective or very effective, they rate 89% of their teacher leaders uh, as effective or uh, very effective. And our school leaders overwhelmingly say this model of distributed and shared leadership is a huge positive for them uh, to help, help develop greater learning uh, in their schools. In, in our breakout sessions, I'm happy to talk a lot more about this model of teacher leadership, some of its very real tensions, but also some of its real opportunities and successes. School leaders, uh, likewise, we really work to uh, develop our, um, our, our school leaders. All of our new school leaders go through an intensive uh, school leadership uh, academy. Our new school leaders, this is principal principals, each have coaches. In addition, they have executive coaches uh, who help them work on some of the social and emotional and interpersonal aspects of being a leader. Uh, every year we take our 20 most, uh, we believe, highest potential assistant principals who are one year away from being principals and they do an intensive year-long residency program with a master principal uh, in a role as a senior assistant principal in the school, essentially a graduate release model, where they're learning directly from that master principal about what it means to be a principal. So our now pool of assistant principals who are ready to become principals then is that much stronger and that much larger. And when we look at the role of teacher leaders and principals, above all what their role is, is how do they lead the learning in their schools to empower teachers and help teachers grow. Because we know from teachers, one of the most important things is how they select a school, their decisions to stay in a school, their feeling of satisfaction in a school, is are they getting coaching, are they getting support, are they learning and growing as professionals? That is the overwhelming duty of our leaders to help our teachers develop and learn uh, and grow. Next slide. Finally, our, our principal supervisors also play a, a vital role. One of the, again, when we think about teams, we have the belief that no team in our in, in Denver Public Schools should be generally bigger than eight or nine people. There's no teacher leader who supervises more than eight or nine people. There's no principal who supervises more than eight or nine uh, teacher leaders or teachers. There's no principal supervisor who supervises more than eight principals. Again, it's a belief in smaller teams, the opportunity for greater uh, feedback uh, and greater growth. And I'm pleased to say, you know, of the 23 principal supervisors, which we call instructional series, from central office to force them to do things, but as their primary coach, as their primary person who helps them uh, learn and grow in their role uh, as a school leader. Next slide. Um, so, also <coughs> talking about culture. So, in a decentralized system, one of the things that really holds us together is a shared vision, that vision of every child succeeds, and a shared set of values. So about five or six years ago, we brought over a thousand of our educators together, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our bus drivers, our custodians, our security guards, our principals, our uh, accountants, for, for an entire day to think about and debate and ultimately select the shared core values that we hold uh, in the Denver Public Schools. And our shared core values uh, in the Denver Public Schools are students first, uh, integrity, right, equity, that belief in every child, uh, collaboration, accountability, and down one if you would, fun. Um, uh, because of that real deep belief that, that learning should be about fun and joy, and also we as adults, 
We're at our best when we have fun and we have joy in our learning. And, and, and we really, our most important recognitions in our schools in the district are not necessarily about which school had the highest test scores or which teacher uh, had the higher performance. It's about which members of our community most embody uh, our values. Uh, and we really celebrate our, our, our values. Every faculty meeting that, that we have, and I meet with the teachers at every school once a year, starts with a celebration, a peer-to-peer -peer celebration on which teachers are, are demonstrating our short, shared core values and how we do it. And at the end of the year, our biggest celebration is we choose uh, uh, four individuals. Again, it could be a teacher, it could be a security guard, it could be a bus driver, again, who most live and embody uh, our shared core values uh, in the Denver Public Schools. And our leadership courses for our teacher leaders or school leaders, they're all about what does it mean to be a values-based leader? What, what are your most important values? How do you live them? How do you share them? Sometimes people ask, and when we chose our six short shared core values, people ask, well, we already have a set of shared core values in our school. Are you trying to replace my values or our values with your values? And the answer was no. The values that you might bring, maybe they're creativity, maybe they're family, maybe they're community. Um, hallelujah, right? Just because we as a community have a set of shared core values, there's nothing to take away from values that each of you uh, as educators uh, bring to your work and, th and that you care uh, very, very deeply about. Last one. So, um, so in sum, uh, our work is about uh, how do we make sure that our schools are the unit of change? How do we empower our educators? How do we do that in a system where we're connected, where we work together, where we share, where we learn together? and above all, come together to share a common mission around every child succeeding and a common set of shared core values about how we're going to support our kids and give each and every one of our students a chance to live their potential and to live their dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for talking to us about some of the specifics that we need to go forward with and for being a a learning partner for Hawaii as we do make the changes that we need. Our next keynote speaker is Ted Dentersmith, who is well known to many of us for all of his time spent in Hawaii and supporting changes in our schools. Ted comes to us as someone who originally was in business and entrepreneurship, and now he focuses on how we can make the changes we need to make in our schools for the next century. He is the um, author of Most Likely to Succeed, and most of us have seen that um, film and have also read his book. His next book, What Schools Could Be, is what you will all be receiving when it's published. And we thank you for sharing more with us this morning. Sound okay? And, and you can rest easy. We don't have to worry about my slides because I never use them. Um, so first I wanna, um, I wanna start with this one. I'm gonna tell you about a trip I took what I learned about this country, and what I learned about this state. But first, you've been a very patient audience. If everybody could just stand up for a second, stretch your legs. But while you're doing it, I want to say a huge thanks to EIH. This conference is impeccably organized. And also, for all of you taking time to be here Saturday morning, if you look around the room, the people in this room can change the course of education in this state. You can out Finland Finland in five years, and if you do, you can change the course of developments in our country and around the world, and that's why I keep coming back. So if we, okay, great. so everybody sit down. Let me just tell you, my, the brief version of my background, I was really fortunate. I spent my career in the world of innovation. I got a PhD in engineering, ran a, a digital uh, circuit company that facilitated or accelerated the digital revolution, and then spent 25 years in venture backing the companies that built Agate's great slide show. You saw what he presented. Take that seriously. It is happening. It's not that it might happen. It's not that it could happen way out there. I'm going to share an anecdote about the driverless car. The Google team of engineers, the team of people who had great jobs at Google, that left those jobs and asked for the funding to develop a driverless car, 
you would think they would be pretty darn optimistic about being able to pull that off, right? You don't put a career on hold in a place like Google, like Google unless you believe it'll happen. The most optimistic person in that founding team said, we won't see driverless cars for 20 years. That's the soonest, 20 years. Five years later, they're three times safer than human driven cars. Six and a half million adults in America make their living driving a vehicle of some sort. All of those jobs gone in 10 years. And it's from white collar to blue collar, every collar of job will be gone. A startup announced last week, they're doing robotic maid service for hotel rooms. They will do it, and it will happen sooner than we think. So having lived my world in venture capital, having lived in the innovation, I saw those trends, and it's increasing, and what is so impossible for us to visualize is it's increasing exponentially, which means every decade that goes by, it's an order of magnitude or more disruption. And so anybody that says, I know what that means, I promise you, you don't. I was with the best venture capital firm in the country backing the top entrepreneurs. None of us knew what was gonna happen 10 years ago, and everything is accelerating. All we know is any job today will either be different or gone. Different or gone, okay? But the second piece of this that I think we really need to emphasize is the impact of technology on citizenship. And they might seem very unrelated, but they are. So a group I support at Stanford, really like an historian group, three years ago they got a little bit of funding to do what seemed at the time like a backwater study. So they started asking high school and college kids basic questions about their ability to dis discriminate between something relatively accurate and well-received, well-researched, and something completely made up. And they were stunned at the results. So not only did most students fail to be able to make any distinction, even our very best students, juniors and seniors at our top colleges, want to make them believe something, here's what you do. Write a research report that says every elementary school kid should come to school each day with an AK-47 loaded. Put it on a website that looks good, www.truefactsaboutguns.org, and have footnotes. And most kids will believe that's a true story, that research is well-founded. And so you see that and you realize if in fact in schools, kids are just reading material, memorizing, and saying it back, if we don't ever teach them how to critique or fact check, why are we surprised that even our top students can't tell the difference between truth and fiction? Three years ago that seemed like a backwater study. I, I think we all know that's front and center of democracy. And so when these things, when these things came into focus for me, and this goes back not quite 10 years ago, I started saying to my friends, and I'd sort of whisper to them, I'd say, I don't believe our civil society will hold together if we don't change schools profoundly and urgently. And seven, eight years ago, honestly, I'd go into a room, a cocktail party, and there'd be like this circle of about 10 feet. Nobody wanted to come near me. You know, I'd be at dinner party, I'd sit down, seat to the right, seat to the left, empty. And I think all my friends said, Ted's losing it. I've said that now in the last 75 talks I've given. Nobody's raised their hand and said, what do you mean? I mean, we see it. It's so fragile. Here's a statistic we should keep in mind. Federal Reserve Board. In America today, if an adult gets a surprise bill for 400 bucks, so crack two, windshield that breaks, 400 bucks surprise bill. 47% of adults in America, the only way they can pay that bill is to beg money off of friends or family or go to the pawn shop. Not 4.7%, 47%. That's, we're in the warm-up, we're in inning number one on machine intelligence. And so you visualize those dramatic increases, you visualize millions and millions of jobs on the line disappearing, if that's how fragile it is. And so what happens, right? If you're alienated, if you're angry, if you're adrift, you'll go to extremes, you'll throw the hand grenade into the ballot box, you'll do worse. And so when you look at that, when you believe civil society is on the line, you do unusual things. And I'd have to say, I think I've done some unusual things. So I started, I said, what's the best contribution I can make? I did this film because, because I feel that the way people change is not through logic, not through rational, well-argumented points, but they change through emotion. And any of you who've seen Most Likely to Succeed, there's a very inspiring story in that film. It's what 
students and teachers are capable of if they're trusted and they're allowed to work on things they think are important. Second thing I did that was unusual, I turned down Netflix with that film. Everybody said, Ted, you're crazy. And they may be well right on that, but we've done 4,000 community screenings all around the world with that film because its role and the reason we made that film was to bring people together to talk about what can be done in their schools. And we go to great lengths in the film to say, don't copy this school. What they do works for them. Everybody needs to do what works for you. And that is quite different and distinctive. Then I took a trip. And, and I felt a little bit like, you can tell, I feel some urgency with this. I mean, obviously, I could be completely retired. I could be on the barge on the water with my wife. During the school year 2015 and 16, I went to all 50 states. It was my daughter's senior year of high school, so all of you who have kids, you know that's not something that you give up easily. But I went to all 50 states. And I learned so much about the country, but I learned so much about this state. And so I'm going to talk about the country, and then I'm going to talk about this state and the unbelievably decisive role you will play in changing the face of this country's path. So as I traveled around the country first, I was one of the few people in my circle not surprised by what happened November 8, 2016. There are so many communities in this country where motels and hotels are boarded up, storefronts are not. Amazon is eviscerating the country, the rural communities of all the small stores that make a living in the heart and soul of that country. And so you visit these people, and they're all people, by the way, who trusted education to give them a better life. And many are finding it didn't. They're all people that want to believe that education will give their kid a fair chance in life, and they're concluding that's not the case. And so you see that, and you say, my gosh, how can this be? The other thing, though, that I saw that blew me away, that led me to write a book, because I thought, and this will sound arrogant, but I thought as I was traveling, I mean, I was ranked tops in the country for venture capital performance for five years. I spent my entire world in innovation. I thought, arrogantly, that I was the expert on innovation. And the phrase I love, and the phrase I use again and again is, <coughs> change happens slowly, right up until it happens quickly. So I'm going to say that again. Change happens slowly, right up until it happens quickly. And so you see these success points, these points of inspiration all across the country. I was able, because I saw so much, and then I spent about six months reflecting on it to sort of begin to piece some things together. What were the common elements of classrooms that were really amazing? And I see in the audience, I had the good fortune last night to sit next to Caitlin, who uh, was on the board of the IH. And I just got goosebumps hearing her talk about what she does with fourth graders. If I had met her a year and a half ago, she'd be in my book, because it was just so profound and interesting. But there were four things that to mark great classroom experiences versus the average ones. And I want to really highlight what the stakes are here. Because the average kid going to school, in the average experience, two things. One, they're studying material they have no interest in, they won't retain, and even if they do, they'll never use later in life. That's the average kid's experience in school today in America. The second thing is, how do you do well in that environment? What are the distinctive characteristics that make you really an outstanding student, a valedictorian, an A student, gobbling up AP courses? What do you have to be good at? Short-term memorization of content, replication of low-level procedures, following instructions. Every single thing Bill showed shows you machines that are already way better than people at that. So that's the average school. What set apart the great things, the things that just were so inspiring? Let's start with knowledge. We all think you're into school to learn. You're into in school to develop real knowledge. Most kids, short-term memory, and it's gone within weeks, <coughs> even days, of when they finish their exam. The schools, the classrooms, and teachers really leave a lasting imprint on their kids. They have great ways to make sure those kids really learned it. And we all know how, when I ask audiences, and we don't have much time, so we, I'll just fast forward to the answer. When I ask audiences, how do you know you've really learned something? How do you know somebody's really learned something? They say, you can apply it. You can create or produce something with it. Or well, most importantly, you can teach somebody else. We all know you <coughs> never learn anything as well as when you teach somebody else. And those teachers actively and enthusiastically look for opportunities to let their kids teach their classmates. How empowering. 
Second thing that marked these great classrooms, agency. We have this irony in our country, right? Kindergarten kids have a lot of agency and voice in what they do. If you look at what they're told to do versus what they get to do, a bunch of their day-to-day -day -day life is what they want to do. Go into the uh, workplace. Apple Computer, computer senior official recently said, and I want, I'm going to say this twice so you can take it away. We have decided that any employee that needs a boss is no longer employable. So we have decided if you need somebody to manage you, we don't want to hire you. But what happens in school? When you talk to high school kids and say, how much agency do you have? How much discretion do you have? I mean, oftentimes, even their after-school activities are picked by their parents or guidance counselor. The start of any given week, if you say to a kid, of 100% normal sleeping hours, how much of it is already determined? It's not 100%. It's 125% normal waking hours. We over-schedule, over-program, they have no agency, no voice, so agency. Skills and competencies. I said before, most schools, it's short-term memorization, replicating low-level procedures, following instructions. The schools and classrooms have really transformed their kids. The teachers that do the most amazing things, they focus on the essential skills. Sorry, skills. So they look at what do they want these kids to be good at. It differs. It doesn't have to be the same from classroom to classroom from school to school, but they're very clear. I want my kids to be good at creative problem solving. I want them to be empathetic. I want them to be great collaborators, but they back it up. It's not just on their website. It's in everything they do in their classes. And I'll go to school after school after school, and the head will meet me and they'll say, we're really focused on collaboration here. And I'll look at the website and they'll say, we want our kids to be a great collaborator. It's a 21st century skill. Then I'll talk to people, students, when do you really get a chance to collaborate? We'll put to the side after school activities where a lot of collaboration gets done and really is the heart and soul of the real learners in a lot of schools. But they'll say, well, we, we tried a project in science class, but one kid did all the work and the other two didn't, so we kind of dropped that, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like, if collaboration is an important skill, do it. And the classrooms and the teachers that are changing lives of their kids, they do it. And the final thing I saw that was a common denominator was this absolutely critical issue, purpose. Why are you doing what you're doing? Most schools, even something that seems like it might be hands-on, like a lab, I'll say to kids, oh, that's interesting, what are you doing? And they'll say, S step three. <laughs> and I'll say, well, that's it. You're like, what's step three? Oh, that's the step after step two. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's, it, in some ways it's really not funny because that's exactly what it is. I'm just doing whatever the next hoop is that's put in front of me. Just keep going through the motions until I get to a certain next level of steps on the thing. And that, that was perfect, ideal preparation when the world was dominated by big, bulky companies like AT&T with labor grades and job descriptions. Just get to step one with the entry-level job, and then step two, three years later, step three, step four, and everything's great. But AT&T, those steps are gone, all the steps are gone, and people have to create their way. The schools are really mad at these kids. When you say to them, what are you working on? They had great answers. They say, I'm doing this because I'm really curious about something. Or we as a group have decided to solve this problem, and so we're trying to figure this out. When you ask the teachers what are you doing, they say, I'm doing what I entered the profession to do, to engage kids and to inspire them to accomplish great things, instead of to prepare them for standardized tests. That honestly, and I always encourage adults to do this, just to keep it fresh in your mind, just put a monthly reminder in your calendar. This month, go back, go online, look at some of these standardized test questions and ask, do I ever use it in life as an adult? And the answer is, you don't. So I looked at that, I sort of summarized those, and I just said, this is so exciting, because if it can happen everywhere across the country, you can find these maverick teachers, these interesting teachers doing it. We don't need to go to Finland to figure out education. We don't need some big R&D initiative. We don't need... Um, you know, and whether it's Arnie Duncan or Betsy DeVos, two, I think, remarkable examples of failure at leadership and education. <laughs> we don't need to wait for them to tell us what we should be doing. The biggest and most important thing in our classroom is to for all kids to memorize and forget the same things they're never going to use in their life. And we need to empower these kids to find their own path. And when you get beyond the standardized test path to letting each kid find their own lane and develop their own confidence, because here is the very, very good news despite what's happening with machine intelligence. First, 
I say, if you want to get really optimistic about the future of our country, the future of our kids, what, what can happen, spend some time with a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. I don't care what neighborhood, I don't care what ethnicity, I don't care about anything. I've met with a lot of four-year-olds in the last three years. What would you observe about any four-year-old? They're bright, they're inquisitive, they ask a million questions, they're learning at warp speed, they think outside of the box. Failure doesn't mean anything to them, they're willing to fail a million times. <laughs> it's there. We don't have to make kids in a certain way that's almost impossible. We just have to stop ruining what's already there at, at age four. The second thing that's really interesting and encouraging is um, the film, Most Likely to Succeed, shows a uh, computer being the best chess player, then we show artificial intelligence being the world's best Jeopardy player now, artificial intelligence being the world's best Go player, on and on and on. What we need to keep in mind is a pretty good computer program with a pretty dedicated person can beat the world's best chess player, can beat the world's best artificial intelligence or computer-based chess player. That combination is really powerful. And so as Bill said so well, if in fact we have our kids competing against the smartphone, if the essence of school is to do the same exact thing as the smartphone phone does instantly and perfectly, we're preparing them to fail. If we leverage them, and then you can, the leverage is whether you're an artist or a philosopher or a scientist. You can be so much more productive if you can leverage machine intelligence. And by the way, learning about technology is one of those interesting things, just like foreign languages. Now, artificial intelligence is beating the world's best go player, on and on and on. What we need to keep in mind is a pretty good computer program with a pretty dedicated person can beat the world's best chess player, can beat the world's best artificial intelligence or computer-based chess player. That combination is really powerful. And so as Bill said so well, if in fact we have our kids competing against the smartphone, if the essence of school is to do the same exact things the smartphone phone does instantly and perfectly, we're preparing them to fail. If we leverage them, and then you can, the leverage is whether you're an artist or a philosopher or a scientist, you can be so much more productive if you can leverage machine intelligence and by the way, learning about technology is one of those interesting things, just like foreign languages. <coughs> Kids at an early age learn really fast. And so when you look at it, and I write about it, Fort Wayne, kindergarten kids design robots. When I was at Molokai, and I see these elementary school kids doing world-class robotics design, you realize, my gosh, if we built on that, look at what these kids can do. And so you see this contrast. You know, we think in education terms in our country, in terms of, can we get our NAEP scores up by 1.2%? Or can we move on the PISA rankings from 29th to 23rd and think that's a big win? That, that's the wrong game to be playing. Can we launch our kids into lives of purpose where what they're learning in school relates to what's going to help them thrive as adults? And that's the obligation and the opportunity we all have. That's what I took away from the country. So I got here, uh, it, was, it was an intense trip, so I'm traveling. Visualize, I was home for the big holidays. I was home for a couple weekends. Other than that, I'm staying in basically Hampton Inns, and, and I traveled for you know, nine and a half months with carry-on luggage. I get here, I am pooped. And, and I just sort of said like, okay, I've done 49 states, I'm gonna do the 50th, I've seen a million things, I can't imagine I'll see anything that different. I, I just, let's just get through it. I could say I got all 50 states, and, and then my wife, or one promise she made when I said I was going to do this, is she said, finish in Hawaii, because then I'll come for the next week after that, we'll have a great vacation. So it seemed like, a, yeah, that's a good plan. Get here, look to the finish line, take a vacation. And then my team, you know, said to me, and they kept saying, you know, there's this guy in Hawaii, you know, you're just going to be really amazed at what he's doing. His name's Josh McCoon. And he sort of volunteered to organize your trip here. And I said, okay, great, what, what do you think he can do for a day? Well, he's not really thinking about it in terms of a day. I say, well, I'm really tired, what's he thinking about? Well, he's thinking about maybe it might be a full week. And I say, well, full week, that's a lot. You know, like, is he really gonna show me anything I haven't already seen? And, and it gets worse, right? I, I, we show up on the Saturday before Mother's Day, and they say, you know, he's working on this thing, he thinks he might be able to get you together with the governor and the first lady. And I say, yeah, sure, I <laughs> sure that one. Huh? And, and then we get this thing, well, you've got a meeting with the governor and the first lady on Mother's Day morning, Sunday morning. And so I say to my wife, okay, so we'll swing by, they'll, they'll give us a hug or something, and then you know, we'll, be, we'll be off and running in two minutes. And uh, we spend 90 minutes. In 200 schools, I'm not expecting 
to see a single school here that blows me away. But that's all I see. In my book, I, I liken it to the finale of the 4th of July fireworks celebration. And there are these incredible public schools and charter schools and private schools. And I'm just like, my jaw is dropping. And, and I finished the trip on such an inspired note. So I just said, I gotta do more, I gotta tell more. And so after that trip, I sort of reflected on this. And I said, if in fact that Hawaii can shock the world with the progress it makes. And this was before we had our new superintendent which is only accelerating all of the great potential you have here. If Hawaii can out Finland, Finland, that could be a wake-up call across the country. And our country needs that because machine intelligence is not going to slow down. They sold in two hours 5,000 copies of the book I wrote with Tony Wagner. They've already signed the rights to translate my new book. Here's what I worry about. The United States will look at these things and say, well, that's really interesting. We should do that. Other countries, like a country like China, will look at this and say, that's really interesting, we're doing it. Well, they look up at you and they trust you. And, and I don't want to be the guy that says, I'm going to prepare you to fail. I don't want to be the guy that says, work hard on something that will make your skill set irrelevant and damage your mindset. We all want to look at that 10-year-old and say, hop aboard, we're going to launch you into a life of purpose and fulfillment and let you accomplish great things in your life. But what I believe, and what I see here, I mean, the reason I keep coming back, this might be in some ways a cheerleader from afar, because I do believe the future of democracy, the future of civil society is on the line. Somebody needs to step up. My hope, my bet, my total inspiration and aspiration is that that place that steps up is Hawaii. I totally appreciate everything you guys are doing, but just remember, Every single thing any of you do can be the tipping point phenomena that really does show the world what a state can do that works together with an aspirational goal in a short period of time. So remember, change, ha change happens slowly, right up until it happens quickly. Thank you.